when you look at all the variations of churches, it is a function of the accuracy of teaching as far as Christ is concerned. And I want to caution you, brethren, there is a lot of... Right now, like before, you have preachers at your, on your fingertips. You can literally watch any preacher anywhere now. And there are preachers that are very aggressive in posting stuff on social media. Don't be excited by crowd pullers. I must warn you. There are some preachers that are pulling crowds, but when you listen to them, what they are preaching is not God's word. Good evening and praise the Lord. Welcome to the Green Pastors Tabernacle Church Media Program. My name is Abel. We I'm choose to get born again because we love the Lord, not mm. because we fear Him. Mm -hmm. That is a weakness. God's reason. mind mm. and God's heart and God's spirit mm. is in His Word. Mm. So ideally, trust in the Lord with all your heart mm -hmm. and lean not on your own understanding. We need understand. to know that we are first responsible to our family. And so we shouldn't be uh, guilty. When if people you... are godly, mm. then life will point to the fact that life is best lived on the foundation of godliness mm -hmm. uh, we need to know when to step in sometimes it is not good for you to take it upon yourself i would rather saved. love christ so that when even if hell is withdrawn mm. how you continue to love the lord amen. amen today i want us to look at the second indicator of effective discipleship and that is edified saints edified saints in Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, the Bible says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. That was number one. And number two, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this word edify or edified, when something is edified, it means it is constructed. It is built up, it's established, it is instructed, it is enlightened, and it is informed and improved. I'm just uh, describing the word edified. And edified, you know, when you talk about a body of Christ that is edified, you want to see a church that is constructed, not constructed in terms of buildings, but constructed in terms of form and likeness of Christ. A body that is built up, people have grown in their knowledge of Christ. People are established. You are not being shaken to and fro. You are not being misled or running after things that you shouldn't be running after. You are instructed, you are enlightened. You can't easily be cheated. You are informed and you are improved. So, so those are the kind of things that I want you to be looking at when you talk about edification. And the goal is that the entire body will grow into unity, maturity, and Christ-likeness. Because we have already seen in verse 12b to 13 for the edifying of the body of Christ till we come or till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so I want to take you quickly through the four characteristics of an edified body. How do we know that a church is built up? How do we know that a church is established? How do we know that a church has come to a place of being instructed, enlightened, informed, and also improved and so that's what i want us to look at and the first one is what we call grown or built up grown or built up and this sometimes takes two forms number one addition of new believers to the body through evangelism one of the ways that we are edified friends as a church is when we begin to see addition of new members to the body through evangelism. That's why a church that is not evangelizing is not doing what it's supposed to do. We cannot say that we have grown when we are not uh, getting new members to the body of Christ. 
And I want to make a statement here that at times, what looks like church growth many times is not church growth. It is transfer of members from one church to another. There's a lot of that happening, even here. We have more people leaving churches to come here than more people getting born again. The kingdom is not benefiting much. It shouldn't excite us when we are just attracting already born again believers here. You see, the church of Jesus Christ is like a farmer who has a huge ranch with different paddocks. It would be foolishness for the farmer to think that when he releases cows from one paddock to another one where there are already cows that his herd has grown. He has simply shifted his cows from one place to another. And so there's a lot of church transfer growth growth which in my opinion is not of course i'm not saying there's anything wrong with joining another church because depending on your level of growth and what's happening and what you're looking for um, there are moments you need to change your church for example next month we are going to release a number of you to go to uh, ruiru now that's different that is we we are we are sowing a seed with the hope that that seed that is sown is going to also evangelize and bring more people to Christ. I know we'll get new members coming to that church who are from other churches, but Pastor Abel and Pastor Lisa should not excite you because that's not growth. That's not growth. So we need as a church to know that we have a responsibility. What will show that we have grown is when we begin to bring new believers here, people who have never been born again. People who don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is addition of new members to the body through evangelism. And in Acts chapter 2 verse 47b, the Bible says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. That is what we mean by being grown up or built up as far as addition of new members to the body through evangelism is concerned. It should not excite any of us when we are not seeing conversions, when we are not reporting new believers here. That when you look at our report as a church, as we come to the end of the year, it should concern us. We'll give you a report at the end of this year what has happened, how the church has performed in various things. But it should make us sad when we see very small numbers of people that are getting born again. And yet we are reporting that uh, the church grew by, say, 10% this year. Now, that 10%, you discover that maybe somebody moved from another church nearby, another one from another church nearby, and they left their churches and came here. And just like other people left this church and went to another church. Now, those kind of things are okay, especially when it is necessary for people to relocate. But when we say start organizing our services here with an aim to attract people who are already in churches because our church maybe sounds better than the neighbor's church or looks better or is cleaner or smarter, uh, we are not doing God's business. Buenas if you Okay, you don't seem to agree with me. But that's the truth. I'm not saying we shouldn't make our environment good. We will continue to do that. We'll improve this hall. Sooner or later, we'll change a few things here, remove these funny-looking uh, things and put better ones, change the roof a little bit, put new mabatis. I hope you don't look at them from the top. Eh? They don't look very nice, okay? But that is not necessarily because we just want the neighbors, members to come here. We want us as a church to come to a place whereby when we step out, we can go out there and talk to people who don't know Jesus and bring them here and disciple them. That's when we can say the church has been grown up or built up uh, quantitatively. But also, there is spiritual growth, and maybe that's where transfer growth helps, because there are people 
who are maybe in congregations where probably either the word is not well properly taught or they are not getting opportunities to develop their spiritual muscles and maybe they find that in another church maybe the level of ministry and the level of organization and opportunities is better than where they are. But even here, we need to pay attention to the fact that we need spiritual growth among those who are saved. It is not enough for people to get born again. We need to see spiritual growth. We want to see believers growing in their faith. And in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Paul says, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. So again, you see Paul's thinking goes away just from not uh, laboring in, 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 in bad pains, but he's also saying we are preaching Christ. And in our preaching, we are also warning every man and teaching every man in all manner of wisdom so that at the end of it all, our teaching helps us to present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, he says, As you therefore have received Jesus Christ, so walk in him, rooted and build up in him, and establish in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Those of you that are keen, you notice that this is the theme scripture of our conferences. We call our conference Rooted in Christ. So the idea here is that in addition to people coming to the Lord Jesus, we need to see spiritual growth among those who are saved. And Apostle Paul says that they preach, they are warning every man and teaching no wisdom. And then he continues to encourage believers that since you have received Jesus Christ, so also walk in him. You need to, and how does it mean to walk in Christ? And that's where discipleship comes in. When people are taught how to walk in Christ, the things we preach, the things we are teaching, so that at the end of the day, all our events, our Sunday services, our meetings are geared to making people learn how to walk, you know, in Christ. And that way, there is, there is growth and there is being built up. The next uh, characteristic of an edifying body is the unity of faith. The unity of faith. Now, if you look at Ephesians 4 and verse 13, there are three phrases. Three phrases. The first phrase is to attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That phrase number one. Number two, to a mature man. And number three, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So I want you to notice that there are three phrases there that are used together. Now, each of these phrases involves a process that leads to a goal. That's what we are saying. And there is a unity of the spirit in the body that already exists at the moment of new birth. I want you to know that at the moment we are born again, there is already unity. So the question is, what unity is the Apostle Paul talking about? In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, the Bible says, For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. So when we get born again, we already are united in the body of Christ. And whether Jews or Greeks, and whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. Now, in this context, Paul refers to the doctrinal unity that comes through that teaching of the word. The doctrinal unity that comes from the teaching of the word. Now, you all know that when everybody is born again, irrespective of the church they belong to, whether Catholic, whatever church, PCA, AIC, whatever, green pastures, at that point when somebody received the Lord Jesus Christ, we are all baptized into the one body. So we are already united there. So the question is, what unity is the Apostle Paul talking about? He is simply talking about the doctrinal unity that comes through the teaching of the word. And that's where things begin to fall apart. You find a believer in green pastures, Tabernacle, and another believer in some church in Malindi. They all say they love the Lord, but one believes they are going to have to fast and die so that they can meet Jesus quickly. That's where the difference starts. 
And that is a consequence of the kind of teaching that each church or each believer receives. When you look at all the variations of churches, it is a function of the accuracy of teaching as far as Christ is concerned. You find that there will be churches that major a lot on welfare, for example. So almost every sermon is geared to how you make more money, how you build a better house, how you will live well, how you will be recognized, how you will basically motivational stuff that anybody who does not even read scripture can actually talk to you about. But then you go to another church where the preacher spends a lot of time opening up scripture concerning who Christ is and what it means to know Christ. So the point is, the more you understand God's word, the more you develop a common knowledge and the love for Jesus Christ. That's what you're calling the unity of faith. Our unity of faith in this church is a function of how we understand God's word. So if we can get to a place whereby God's understanding of, I mean, our understanding of God's word is brought to the same level, then you find that we'll be united in faith. It is true we are already united because we are baptized in the same body. But then you find there are times where you, you, you find in the same church, there are believers who will be very scared about, they are paranoid about witchcraft. Okay? When they see some strange, or they see a cat, you know, cross their road when they are going to work. They are born again. But they have to go back to the house and maybe pick some anointing oil and come and pour where the cart passed. And then they can go to work. But there's another believer who sees a cart and just say, this is just a cart, let it go where it is going, I'm going where I'm going. Because their level of understanding of who Christ is in their life is so high that something like that won't scare them. I don't know whether that example makes sense. So in the same church you find people who have very different levels of understanding. I, I have in this church known that there are, there, there, are, there are some believers who still go to consult uh, prophetesses and prophets behind my back. Because they believe that uh, Bishop Malili doesn't operate in power and in glory. He doesn't prophesy over us. He doesn't break curses over us. And that's fine. I would understand because if you go to the level where I understand, for example, where I know that we are raised up together with Jesus and we are seated with him in the heavenly places far above every principality. Now, you need a revelation of that scripture. So once you get that revelation, you know that where you and Christ are seated is so high that like somebody say that word far above simply means that distance between where Jesus is seated and where demonic operations are. The distance is so big that unless the demons are helped to bridge it, they can't get there. Now you need a revelation of that. The third characteristic of an edified body is maturity. Paul uses the singular word for a full-grown man, probably referring back to the one new man of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 to 15, which is the church made up of Jews and Gentiles reconciled to Christ and to one another. Verse, uh, I, think, I think it is verse 14 and 15, if Ephesians 2, 14, 15. The Bible says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished his flesh, the enmity that is in the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two that making peace. Now, one of the signs of maturity of a church is when differences don't matter.
when we can all be here together, we have brothers in here who are millionaires or even billionaires, and there are other brothers and sisters here who even putting food on the table is a miracle. And when we meet, we still worship and greet each other like there's no difference. Paul gives the contrast of a child as an immature church, tossed to and fro by every wave and wind of doctrine. One of the reasons why we're in trouble in Kenya, to the point that the government is even threatening to step in and bring regulation in the churches because we have simply failed the simple test of biblical regulatory framework. And I want to caution you, brethren, there is a lot of, right now, like before, you have preachers at your, on your fingertips. You can literally watch any preacher anywhere now. And there are preachers that are very aggressive in posting stuff on social media. Don't be excited by crowd pullers. I must warn you. There are some preachers that are pulling crowds, but when you listen to them, what they are preaching is not God's word. They are very eloquent. They have a message that looks like a message hope, but it is not a message hope. It's a message based on how to package yourself as a human being and how to win in life. Okay? There are other preachers who all of a sudden have a revelation. And they are undoing everything we have known all our lives. Maturity is not just reference to our individual maturity in Christ, but also to our corporate maturity as a church. We are not talking about just maturity as an individual, but when as a church we become corporately mature. That's what I said earlier. Where we can come together here, we worship without caring whether you are Kikuyu, Luo, Mkamba, with political party you are affiliated to, uh, your social class. When we come here, we don't pay attention to a social class. People you know, came in here driving cars, others came by Matatu, others by Tuk Tuk, others walked. But when we come here, we don't have songs for those who came with SUVs and songs for those who came by bicycle. We sing the same song. And we are not intimidated. One as we That's the kind of maturity we are talking about. And the final characteristic of an edified body is the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Now, stature speaks figuratively of maturity. Because stature has something to do with height and bigness. So the measure of spiritual maturity is nothing less than the fullness of Jesus Christ, who is the very fullness of God. That's where you begin to discover then discipleship is a lifelong process. Because it's unlikely, although there's a possibility, because it depends on the yieldedness of people. Can you imagine if one of us here, you know, attained the fullness of Christ? So that means that none of you should ever get to a place you think you have become too mature as a sister, as a brother. That you start neglecting prayer, start neglecting Bible study, start neglecting the gathering of brethren and the fellowships. There are brethren who get to a place they feel like they, they are too mature, they know too much. But the, the measure is the fullness of Christ. So if you really have become Christ, then we can talk. But I think most of us have a long way to go. There's a lot to learn. In Colossians 1.19, the Bible says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And then Colossians 2.19, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, when you attain the fullness of Christ, you are actually saying you have the fullness of Godhead. 
In other words, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, they all are completed inside of you. If you can understand the level of standard, this lifts our path for growth. We would stop playing around with anything that helps us to grow. So the goal of the church is that it would grow or she would grow to complete Christ-likeness so that when the world looks at us, it gets a glimpse not only of the Savior, but also the Godhead. The expectation is that individually as believers, we should be so much full of Christ that when people see us, they don't ask, where is God? That's why Jesus, when Thomas and the disciples were asking him to show him the Father, he was surprised. He asked them, I've been with you, and you are saying, I show you the Father. And then he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Of course, the problem was not Jesus. The problem was the level of understanding and revelation that the disciples had. At some point, they began to see that. Okay? And so, I need you to know that the expectation is such that as believers, we need to come to a place whereby when people meet us, they have made, it's like they have met the Lord. That's a high standard. The way you speak to people, the way you handle people, just your spirit. And that's why you find it's been very difficult to evangelize the world because we try to tell people of something they can see. It becomes very difficult to be effective witnesses of Jesus if we ourselves cannot demonstrate what we believe and who we are. And that's why this whole thing about being members of the body of Christ and being disciples of Jesus Christ is much more serious than we take it. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to learn. And there's a lot of growing together that we need to so that the commitments and the availability that we provide in terms of our corporate worship and also individual work with God demands a lot more than we, we give it. In conclusion, I just want to tell you three things. Number one, I want to encourage you to open yourself to be equipped. Please open yourself to be equipped. And, and, and begin to ask questions. Don't just get excited with preaching in ministry. Every time you sit in a place where the word is being preached, interrogate it. I've already told you that the end goal is Christ-likeness. When somebody preaches to you, ask yourself, how is this someone making me more Christ-like. Number two, get involved in equipping others. It's not enough for you to just be equipped, but equip others. Don't just be a ministry consumer. One of the biggest tragedies of the church in the 21st century is the church has become a consumer church. We're just looking for ministry to consume. We want to be preached to, we want to be prayed for, we want to be blessed. And that's why when you begin to change the narrative and begin challenging people to go, then that becomes unpalatable. Because we want to receive, we don't want to give. Remember what Bishop Charles said? I had not told him that actually this church closes doors sometimes on Sunday service and we get out. I have never told him that. It's interesting that he confirmed what we have been trying to do. That there are times we need to just come here, sing two songs, 
and get out and minister to people where they are because they won't come here unless we go to where they are. And finally, let us radiate the glory of Christ. Let's radiate the glory of Christ. This, of course, is a function of how much you have grown and how much of the revelation of Jesus you have. Let me tell you, as I, as I close, unlike we are caused to believe, Christ is much more willing to reveal himself to us than we want. It doesn't please him to be mysterious to us. But what happens is I think we are, we are not serious. And sometimes I'm sure he wonders, even when I reveal myself to these people, what will change in their lives? Let's pray. Father, we thank you because of the discussion today. Father, we've said many things that pertain to evangelism and practical things that we need to do to make ourselves effective. I pray that you help us. And even as we step out and share the gospel that many people will be uh, convicted. Thank you that it's the love of Jesus that draws us to you. And I pray that we will not forget that it's because of that love that we are who we are. So we praise you and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.